Welcome to Be The Wellness Podcast, where we help you master your body, mind, and the experience of life through insightful conversation, interviews with experts and thought leaders, all with a side of marital banter and some good old-fashioned humor. Yes, we are your hosts, Adam and Vanessa Lambert, and we're committed to helping you live life fully expressed physically, mentally, and experientially. Sit back, grab a cup of coffee, and join the conversation. Welcome, everybody, to Be The Wellness Podcast. Adam and Vanessa Lambert enjoying a sunny, rainy day. Yeah, it really started off with a bang, but it really turned turned on us. Turned on us. Yeah. Man, this weather in Southern California, it's like finally we have something to report. I know. It's true. But yeah. we did get a good couple hours of sunshine this morning, so. It's true. Beggars not be choosers. Yeah. Right? I busted out my D-Minder app. Yeah. You know? And yeah. The mm-hmm. kind. And how did you score? Um, pretty good. Yeah. You know, the problem that I run into is that I'm Northern European. <laughs> so, yes. So basically it's like, it, you know, cause it, it'll tell you like, for those that are not familiar, D minder like takes your position, the relationship of the sun and how intense the UV rays are at any given time to like help you determine how much vitamin D you're getting. Right. And the problem I run into is that I hit the max threshold for not getting sunburned before I get enough vitamin D. Uh, yeah. So it's like, ding, a leave the sun. A supplementer for life. <laughs> yeah, leave the sun quickly. You're going to burn. So yeah. anyway, but, you know, it but happened. the good news is you got the sun, and it definitely was a mood booster. If yeah. it didn't quite fulfill your vitamin D needs, yeah. it definitely made you happy. That's true. You were floating around here like a little Twitter-pated fairy dust. <laughs> Is that right? I don't even know. <laughs> yeah, that might be an exaggeration. That, but you, but were, you were quite happy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what else makes me happy? What? Montana. Montana, yes. Yes. Montana is um, going to be pretty epic. It is. And we have still a few spaces for individual People. females. So yeah. we are sold out on our couples' rooms, but we have some room for single females or girlfriends who want to come together. We've got space in one of our two bunk rooms. So if you're thinking about joining Montana, now is a good time to grab those remaining spaces. Yep. And that's coming up in the middle to end of November. No, September. September. (laughs) It sounds like November. It does. But it's actually (laughs) September. In fact, they rhyme. (laughs) They They do. They rhyme, but they start with different letters. But we do still have space in November for our Costa Rica retreat. And that we actually do have one more couple's room. Mm -hmm. So if you are wanting to get in on one of our retreats as a couple, that's an awesome opportunity to grab our last king suite and then we also have a cool um space at that retreat which is kind of interesting it is um i think they call it an apartment suite so it's actually Mm -hmm. like a it's a larger space that has um, a king size bed but then it also has the opportunity to bring in two extra beds in there so if you are a group of four girls or you know a group of four dudes or whatever and you want to share a bigger apartment space we have room for that as well. So a um, couple options still available in Costa Rica. And then for Montana, just the individual female spaces. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, we haven't yet talked about this, I don't believe, on air. But we have launched officially our retreat offering for Rhythmia in Costa Rica next year. And so that will take place December 15th through 22nd, right before Christmas, which is Kind of, it sounds like, you know, oh, I don't know, right before Christmas, like maybe that would be tough, but it's actually really amazing because you have some space after Christmas coming into the holidays where, yeah, you might be with family and a lot of stuff might be going on, but at least you're not headed straight back to work. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's true. It's true. <laughs> You've got some space between the holidays to kind of decompress from that experience, which we will have you know is pretty awesome to have. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a good one for sure. Yeah. So September, November, and December of this year, we've got stuff going on. We've got a few spaces left for each. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So... Go to be the wellness.com and, and select your spot. Yes. Go to the retreats and adventures page and you can check out all the offerings and yeah, grab your space. That's what's up. That is what's up. And you know, it's really exciting. We've got some cool, we've got about almost, I'd say like a 50, 50 blend of returnees and brand new people mm-hmm. attending this year so far. And that's just really exciting. Oh, and I should mention actually 
that we had one cancellation for an individual female in New Zealand. So folks out there, I've just fed that out to our inside community, but if you want to grab that space, email me at info at be the That space isn't actually live on the web right now because that um, retreat is listed as sold out. But if you hear this and you're like, darn, I really wanted to go to that. We do have one spot that just opened up for that. Yeah. So lots of options and um, it's really about picking your favorite and, and getting on in. Yeah. Yeah. yeah 100%. So be the is the spot for that. Yes. Always, as always, you can just email us info at be the wellness. Yes. And we'll answer any questions you might have. Absolutely. And moving on, we have a really awesome podcast today, which was, you know, it was actually a request from our community. We had, we like to ask in Unveil Your Wellness and our Be The Wellness community on um, our app on Vimify every once in a while, you know, who would you like us to interview? What kind of interviews would you like on the podcast? And we had a couple of requests for a holistic vet, mm -hmm. which I thought was a great idea. And certainly finding a holistic vet for us in when we first got Penelope in her early years made a huge impact on her health overall and is one of the main reasons I think she's doing so well at 15 years old today. Right. So we were more than thrilled to reach out and I found this amazing doctor, Dr. Angie Krause, and she owns Boulder Holistic Vet in Boulder, Colorado. And she really takes kind of a multi-prong approach, giving, you know, both traditional advice and holistic vet care to her patients. And, you know, in order to really help them live their most longe long longevitous longevitous life. <laughs> longest? <laughs> <What's> longest life. <laughs> Gosh, I love making up words. Yeah. Um, but really to live, you know, their healthiest life for the long term. And she's got a lot of great advice today. We fielded out some um in the community, we asked if anyone had any specific questions. So we tried to get to a bunch of our questions that we got specifically from our bees. But within the context of answering that question, those questions, there is tons of great information. Yeah. So listen in. I bet that there will be something that pertains to you and your pet that could make a difference in their life story. Yeah, 100%, especially when it comes to dogs and cats. Absolutely. That, yes. That's that primarily what we focus on. Yep, yep. 100%. <laughs> yeah. So um, again, this is Angie Krause and she owns Boulder Holistic Vet. You can also visit her at boulderholisticvet.com. She's got an awesome blog with lots of information on um, cooking food for your dog, CBD oil, um, all kinds of great information for just really the total holistic care of your cats and dogs. And obviously she treats other animals as well, but the prim primary focus for us in our conversation was on cats and dogs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And without further ado, here's Angie. And we're live. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Angie. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, it's exciting to have you and um, also your dog on the podcast. <laughs> Pugsley's going to make an appearance. I know it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just thought I would introduce, is it a he or a she? I think he's a boy. He's a boy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so thanks for being with us. I'm really excited. You know, it was probably about 15 years ago that I was introduced to the concept of there being a holistic vet. And um, I remember a friend, we had just gotten our puppy Penelope, who's a Bichon Frise, and she was getting those terrible black tear stains under her eyes. And a friend of mine said, you should take her to a holistic vet and see what's going on. And so I was like, what's a holistic vet? So that's my first question to you. What is a holistic vet? Well, a holistic vet to me um, means a veterinarian that uses traditional medicine and alternative therapies together. And basically, mm -hmm. I use whatever works, um, but I think about the body um, in a more holistic way. Mm, yes, we are big fans of that here at Be The Wellness, so <laughs> you're speaking our language. Um, so I think the first thing I'd like to start with is, you know, the biggest question I think folks have when they first get a pet or as a pet owner is how to decide what to feed their dog or cat. What is sort of the, um, I don't know, the, the process in which you help people to understand what's best for their pets? Well, I think what you feed your pet is the most important decision you can make for them. And it really depends on your budget and um, how much time you have and then what your pet 
will eat. Uh, they are mm-hmm. really an active participant, especially cats, um, in their <laughs> own in their own diet and wellness. Mm. So, with that said, then is that because the what seems to be available, right? You go into a pet food store, and it's like more confusing even than just a like a grocery store. There are so many different varieties and so many different things that are going on. Are there? Some things like right out the gate that you would say for for dogs should probably avoid grains or or whatever the the thing is, or like just some sort of high level do this, don't do that. Yes, I think overall, uh, when I think about nutrition, the less processed, the better. Just like mm-hmm. with us, now whether mm-hmm. that's raw or cooked, uh, I think that's really dog dependent, and just like with people, you know some. Some people say, well, we should all be eating a raw diet, but not everybody does well on a raw diet. Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. while I think most dogs do well on a raw diet, I've certainly seen um, a subset of the population that just doesn't do well. And so if you're going to go like the least processed route, then a home cooked diet is probably the Mm -hmm. best diet. Now, that being said, we don't all have the time or the financial resources to cook for our dogs especially if you have, right. you know, three 70 pound dogs, um, cooking right. for them <laughs> might just be, um, not realistic. And so then we have to think about what commercial, um, varieties we have that are available either at a boutique pet food store or at Petco, um, depending on what you have access to. And what's tricky about uh, pet food is that reading the labels is only kind of helpful you're getting mm. a little bit of the information, but you can't really um, ascertain if it's a really good food. Now, some dogs don't do well with grains, and I don't think cats should eat grains ever. Uh, but when they do well with grains, usually it's a, a gluten-free grain um, like uh, rice or quinoa or millet. Uh, but mm. unfortunately, what most of the mainstream pet food companies put in their diets are like wheat and corn and soy, and those tend to be really allergenic, in my opinion. Mm. Yeah, I was actually told by the holistic vet that I took Penelope to that I believe he said um, chicken, corn, soy, and I don't know, maybe it might have been grains, were some of the top um, foods that most dogs had allergies to. And I was actually really surprised to hear chicken because so many of the products that you see are chicken based. Is that one that you find that folks are, or that, um, to folks, <laughs> furry folks are, um, <laughs> are commonly allergic to, or what, how do you decide yes. which meat sources are best for the dogs? You know, you really can't know until you mm-hmm. try and chicken is a common allergen, but unfortunately, just like people, dogs and cats to a lesser extent are becoming more allergic um, just to mm. anything, to carrots, to um, peas, um, to anything. And so I think that while we think, you know, we have mostly dogs that are allergic to the protein sources, all food has protein in it, whether it's mm. an apple or a piece of beef, it all has protein. And I, I see more and more food allergies that don't really follow the rule that dogs are allergic to the protein source. That's mm-hmm. not necessarily true. So yeah. unfortunately, you're guessing. And mm-hmm. um, there are signs that your dog um, and symptoms that they have that might give away that they have a food allergy. But until you have those or they react poorly, you can't really know. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting because um, I actually, I did find that Penelope, our dog, when we removed chicken, we removed gluten, we gave her a grain-free diet and a chicken-free diet, we were able to get rid of the tear stains completely. And she's been free of them for her entire life, which is pretty cool given that I know that most, I see these little white dogs, you know, all around with these tear stains. And I think, oh, you know, most of them end up living that that way their whole entire life because their, you know, pet owners don't necessarily get a chance to sort out what's causing that. But, um, as she's gotten older, I've been able to reintroduce chicken if it's cooked by me. And so I think there's something about the actual chicken, the, the way that the chicken is processed or maybe the quality of the chicken that's available in the food that might actually be almost the bigger culprit. I'm wondering about your thoughts on that. 
Yes, I see this commonly, unfortunately, that dogs can handle one type of um, meat. And then if you prepare it in a different way, then they they can't handle it. And I've seen it go either way. Like if you put chicken in a kibble, it's too processed. They don't do well, but they can have chicken cooked freshly at home. I have one dog in my practice that is on a uh, lamb kibble, a lamb-based kibble. But if you were to feed this dog freshly cooked or even raw lamb, he reacts. And so it's really all about how um, the protein is either um, processed or not processed. And I think there are nuances that we don't quite understand and and maybe aren't willing to look at as a a veterinary profession. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, it's the same for humans, right? <laughs> it's like <laughs> yes. sometimes I can eat this, like chicken nuggets are not the same thing as a chicken breast, you know, at the end of the day. Um, right. So I'm wondering, you know, the, the idea of, of home cooking or preparing dog food or cat food, I, we'll probably just keep referring to dogs because that's what we have. Okay. But the, okay. um, but the, the idea of preparing this stuff at home seems like, it, like, where's the recipe for that? You know what I mean? Like, what is it, what do they need to, to be included in that food for it to be sort of a, a whole food diet, essentially for a dog? I mean, I think, you know, as humans, we have a pretty good understanding of what that entails, but you know, they need something more than just muscle meat and fat, right? I mean, what, what would be, what would constitute a good homemade dog food? It's true. If we were to go into the kitchen and say, okay, I'm going to prepare some chicken and rice and, um, you know, some vegetables or, you know, whatever we're going to make for ourselves. And we were to give that to our dogs that would not be balanced for them. Mm -hmm. I feel like we know a little bit more or we're more scientific about uh, canine nutrition than we are about our own nutrition. And we, we have a lot of science around um, these minimum values. And I call them minimum values because we, we think that probably we could be doing more of a lot of them, but what keeps dogs alive and healthy for at least a certain amount of time. And so when we just home cook without adding vitamins and minerals, um, we know we come up short And Mm -hmm. there are a lot of great resources out there. And my favorite is balanceit.com. And you can go on there and create your own recipe with your own ingredients, um, with whatever they have to choose from. And uh, you can say my dog's active, or I want um, a no grain diet or a moderate carbohydrate diet. So you can go on there and select all of these things. And then they have a vitamin and mineral mix that they will tell you this is how much you measure out for this recipe. So it's just a giant Mm. calculator Mm. that's going to help you do that. And I think those types of services make it the easiest because if you go to vitamin cottage or whole foods and pick all of the, you know, vitamins and minerals, like it it would be, it's, it's kind of a nightmare that way. And then you Mm -hmm. have all these powders on the food and you really want to pick a supplement that's made to balance a meal and not the supplements that you see the natural pet food stores that are made to add on to an already balanced meal. Um, Cause those will always come up short. Got it. So what these guys do is you, you can put in the ingredients that you have and that you intend to prepare and then they'll formulate and ship you a powder or something to, to mix in with it, Mm -hmm. to balance it out. Correct. And then the powder um, is always the same. And so if you wanted to uh, change the recipe, you could do that. And so I feel like it's the most empowering way to cook safely. Awesome. I love that. So say your dog has any given or, or cat has any given sign of their diet not working, whether it's, you know, skin condition or, um, you know, whatever their stool, paw licking, whatever it is, they're showing signs that something that they're eating isn't doing well for their body. What is the process of elimination? What do you start with? What do you say, okay, let's clean the slate by getting rid of X, Y, and Z, and then reintroducing X, Y, and Z. What's that process look like? So for me, if I am dealing with a dog, uh, the first thing I do is I take grain out of the diet Mm -hmm. because sometimes it's just that simple. And if that's all we had to do, then we'd be happy. Um, If that doesn't work, then I will start um, saying like playing around with protein sources. Mm -hmm. We're okay. We're on an all um, beef diet. Let's switch to chicken. And we Mm -hmm. make sure that we're not getting any beef. And so you Mm -hmm. 
um, kind of can go piecemeal. And then if that doesn't work, then you can do a more limited ingredient diet, either cook or um, find a kibble that's, you know, sweet potato and lamb or lamb and rice, or you just kind of get down to like a few ingredients. Mm -hmm. And then if that doesn't work, then I do an amino acid based diet to just give us an idea if what we're experiencing is even caused by a food allergy or if something else is going on. Mm. Can you expand a little bit deeper on that? What that process of an amino, uh, sorry, what did you say? An amino acid based diet. Thank you. Amino so, acid based diet. Yes. Yes. So our immune system reacts to proteins. And I think of a protein like a strand of pearls and each pearl is an amino acid. The longer the strand of pearls, the more reactive that protein is. And when we break down the protein into individual amino acids, the body is going to have a less um, likely uh, probability of re reacting to it. And so um, when we hydrolyze diets, we break them down into like four or five amino acids at a time. And a lot of veterinarians use hydrolyzed diets. And I find that they don't really work because oftentimes by the, by the time we're there, our patient is so reactive that they're probably still going to be reacting to those four to five amino acids. Uh -huh. And when we can break it down even more to the individual amino acids, I have better success. Mm. But the problem is, is that an amino acid-based diet is a prescription diet. Mm -hmm. And if you were to read the ingredients, like you would be horrified, but it's really a helpful diagnostic. And when dogs can get on amino acid-based diets and do well, it's a really important opportunity we have to rest their gut. Mm -hmm. We give them 12 weeks of gut rest so their gut can heal up from all the damage that was done from the previous allergens. And then we add real food um, one at a time back into the diet so we can build a functional ingredient list. And sometimes just by having that 12 weeks of gut rest, we can actually add in that chicken that was bothering them before. And because we've healed up the gut, then they can tolerate it. This sounds it's just so <laughs> exactly much like, like humans. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, totally. Like the autoimmune <laughs> protocol, you know, is fundamentally mm -hmm. the same thing. It's, you know, letting everything heal up. And what I think is, well, this is something that we see in, in just dealing with, with human nutrition is that often the, the, the last piece that you just said, that is like, once this is healed, then you can reintroduce these other foods. Like that piece gets missed a lot on the human side. And they're like, man, I just have to eat this way forever, which, you know, for some people might be the case in extreme cases, but a lot of times that like recognizing that something has healed and now you can reintroduce like a whole nother world of food to them is, uh, is something that gets missed. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. So I have um, a couple of questions from our community that I want to try to couch in one. So we've got one that's asking about um, both of her dogs having had cancer in their later years. And then I've got one who's talking about um, their all of their pets end up with kidney disease. And they're wondering if the food that they're feeding their dogs could be related to these particular things since they're seeing it repeatedly with their dogs. So the, um, the kidney disease wasn't for cats. Uh, not, you know what? That's actually oh. a good question because it says, um, Oh, all of our cats. Sure enough. <laughs> I thought it said all of our animals, <laughs> all of our cats. Yes. All cats. Yes. <laughs> yes. Kidney disease. It's, the, it's the fate of all cats. I've never met an older cat that didn't have some, measurable amount of Ooh. kidney disease. Okay. And we don't know why that is, if that's primary, uh, primarily genetics, mm -hmm. or if it's what we're feeding them. Um, a couple of years back, I was at a conference, there was some talk about vaccines in cats um, mm -hmm. with kidney disease. Um, although I've seen cats that have been really minimally vaccinated that, that still go on to get kidney disease. So I don't think that's going to be um, the missing piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. I think probably mostly it would be genetics. Although I think we are rethinking how we uh, feed cats. We've been feeding them like small dogs for so long and with kibble and high carbohydrate um, preparations uh, that we're kind of headed back the other way to the to the more the mouse diet, if mm -hmm. you will. Mm -hmm. And so as we go that way, I wonder if we'll see less kidney disease or if it's something that genetically they're just prone to. Mm. Yeah. Well, is that, so is it something that we see And this just 
correct me if I'm really steering this in the wrong direction, because I, I, you think about wildcats, you know, and they just uh, like lions are on pretty much a zero carbohydrate diet, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. at least as far as you can tell from what they're, except for what they might get out of the entrails of whatever they ate. Right. So mm-hmm. is it, is it fair to make a correlation between that and, you know, a house cat at some level of I do. I think that's, that's, that's fair. Yeah. And we use it a lot. There's some dental disease that, um, big wild cats have that, that house cats also have that we're, we've been trying to blame ourselves with the diet or not enough vitamin D or too much vitamin D. Um, but then their counterparts in the wild also get this type of dental disease. So I think, um, some of it is just genetic. Yeah. Mm. That's what's up with cats. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) And I think you're right. We are trending towards feeding them more their natural diet, except for the whole, don't get me started, vegan cat movement. Yeah. Oh no. I I have not, I have not been part of a vegan cat movement. Well, there's just a, there's a whole um, subset of people out there that are trying to feed their cats vegan basically mm, no meat yeah. which and is dogs yeah and dogs yeah but it, i think correct me if i'm wrong i think it's particularly detrimental to cats to be particularly yes yes there's i mean it's it's not um it's not just alternative to think cats should eat a low carbohydrate diet um 15 years ago at texas a&m we were taught that that kibble was pretty much the worst thing you could feed cats and mm-hmm. that they should be on a really high protein low carbohydrate diet so um Yes, I think it, we know we know very well now that cats really should not be eating kibble or that mm. much carbohydrate. And yeah. and to be vegan, the carbohydrate content is just so high. Yeah, it's yeah. Fundamentally, the diet. Yeah. So please, yes, feed your cats meat. <laughs> yes, they will live um, longer and have less inflammation. Yeah, definitely. And so, and then getting back to um, the the dogs with sarcoma. Do you find that that's kind of the fate of most dogs? Is Because I hear this eventually with dogs that tumors are typically what we find in old age that, you know, kind of does most of them in. What What's your thoughts on how the diet affects um, cancer in particular? I, I think diet uh, affects cancer with many other factors. I think, you know, our vaccinations, our... Um, what we've done to our intestinal bacteria and um, the pollutants in our homes um, and in the environment. I think all of those have some part to play on top of genetic predisposition. Mm -hmm. Right. Let's talk about vaccinations then, because that's definitely something that a lot of our listeners were asking about, and I'm curious about as well. What are your thoughts on how to approach approach vaccinations as well as recurring meds like heartworm, flea meds, um, all of these kind of consistent things that we're told to give on a monthly basis? Well, I'll start with uh, heartworm medications. I think that really depends on where you live. Mm -hmm. I'm so lucky in Boulder, Colorado, that we really don't, I mean, I maybe see a few fleas a year. Mm -hmm. And so we're, it's, we're just so high up. It's so dry here. And we don't see heartworm disease in this little county pocket um, Mm. that we're in. And so for most of my patients, I worry more about when they travel outside of our little bubble. Mm -hmm. And um, heartworm disease is preventable. Some of the medications that we use to prevent it can have some side effects depending on how healthy um, your dog is. And so I think that's that's where it gets tricky is that we're not taking an individual enough approach. Mm. When I am worried about my patient, I just use ivermectin and there we kind of have a lot of fancier heartworm preventatives out there. And um, ivermectin for me is in and out. It's got a really um, wide safety margin. So I'm not worried about any neurological side effects. And it's such a, a tiny dose that I feel okay. So if people are worried about um, heartworm disease, then an ivermectin product like HeartGuard, or there's a million of them out there now. I think as a holistic vet, that's the the least invasive. Mm-hmm. Heartworm disease is prevalent in other parts of the country and it's bad. And mm-hmm. what's tricky about it is that to treat it, it's really bad. Like the the dose of poison you have to give a dog is, it's it's not good. And sometimes dogs have side effects and you have to keep them um, still so they don't get an embolus. And it, so the treatment's pretty funky. And so if you live in a, a really um, densely populated area with heartworm disease, I would prevent it. 
There are some holistic veterinarians that really feel like if you can keep your dog healthy, they won't get heartworm disease. Mm. Mm. What's tricky about that is that sometimes no matter what we do to keep ourselves or our dogs healthy, we just can't. Mm -hmm. And um, I feel like heartworm disease is so easily preventable that Mm -hmm. I prevent that. So now the, oh, go ahead. Really quick with the heart, with the heart prevention um, or the heartworm prevention, correct me if I'm wrong, but if you are going to travel, so we are in a similar area in Los Angeles, heartworm is not prevalent here. So we do the same thing when we travel with our pets, we will treat them, but correct me if I'm wrong, you're supposed to treat them post, right? So heartworm is, um, is like you, we want to treat after they've had the exposure, correct? You can treat before or after. Uh Um, it's good for 30 days, but it also has a a 30 day reach back. So I usually, um, if you wanted to treat when you went and then when you came back, you could do that. Or if you go and then come back and you think, Oh no, I, I totally forgot to give my dog heartworm prevention. You can use it then too. Perfect. Awesome. And then how about the vac- vaccinations in general? Vaccines are a really uh, tricky topic. And I hear a lot of people say, um, they make these statements like um, vaccines don't work um, or vaccines kill dogs or, um, you know, anytime you make a statement like that, I just think just be beware of what you're listening to um, because it's so individual and then it's individual um, for which vaccine you're talking about. Mm-hmm. So when we're talking about a vaccine like rabies, like I have no doubt that rabies is important because it's saving our lives. Mm-hmm. And on the same um, same token, I've definitely seen rabies vaccines cause injury to dogs mm. and um, and to cats as well. And so I think it's really important to ask yourself, how healthy is my dog or my cat? And if your dog or cat is healthy, then okay, they're a good candidate for vaccines, but then you need to think about what vaccine you're giving and is it even in your area? Mm. Is your dog predisposed by age um, or by lifestyle? And then you want to think about if my dog got this disease, what are the risks of getting the disease versus getting the vaccine? Mm. And then the last thing I really encourage people to do is if you do decide to use vaccines, to get them done one at a time. Mm -hmm. And I know it's not the most convenient way to go, but I see less vaccine reactions. And I think dogs and cats just do better when we can space them out and, Mm -hmm. and give their body time. Yeah, give their immune system a chance to actually buck up to the challenge. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and vaccines are not a way, um, that veterinarians are getting rich. And I think it's, I think people get really, um, on one side or the other and, and being a holistic vet, I kind of just like straddle, um, straddle the line of, I I can see both sides. Mm -hmm. Like there are ways that veterinarians can prevent disease. And so we're, we're trying to do that, but what doesn't happen is their recognition that, um, vaccines cause problems sometimes. Mm-hmm. And so I think where pet parents get so alienated is they'll say, oh my gosh, my dog just hasn't been the same since that vaccine. Mm-hmm. And then the reaction they get from their veterinarian is like, oh, well, it was probably something else or just coincidental. Mm-hmm. And so then you just have this breakdown in um, the communication um, between the veterinarian and the pet parent and the pet parent doesn't feel heard and, and vaccine reactions certainly do happen. And that information that they were trying to get back to their vet, when that gets missed and then that dog keeps getting vaccinated, I feel like that's where um, chronic problems mm. um, really take root. Gosh, it's just the parallels between, you know, <laughs> dealing with humans and their doctors and dealing with dogs and their vets, is they're just so close. It's like if the, the communication level between and the amount of time spent with the individual patients is just such a critical piece of the whole thing. It's so critical. Yes. And I always tell people like, I work for you when I'm, I'm at a client's house, I work for you and I can give you the information I have, but ultimately it's my job to support them Mm -hmm. um, and help them make the best medical decision because there's not necessarily, or there's very few times where it's very black or white. This is what you should do. Right. Um, You just really have to look at like your risk assessment and what you're comfortable with. Um, what risk you're comfortable taking. Mm. 
So um, I'd love to talk about the raw diet for a minute because um, it sounds like it's really effective for some dogs and um, cats as well, I would assume. I have not had a cat and given it a raw diet, but (laughs) I do have experience with feeding our dog Penelope um, the raw diet for many, many years until she just completely vetoed it. <laughs> it wasn't just one day. She was completely done and she would she would literally starve out for days. She was like, I'm not doing this anymore. <laughs> she was making her own life decision she was, right there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she definitely does that. And then um, when we got our other dog, Daisy, we tried to introduce her to a raw diet, but she just could not adapt. She constantly vomited. No matter how we tried to ease her into it, we would cook it, you know, three quarters of the way, whatever we would do, she really did not tolerate it well. So curious if you can talk about how you can tell if your dogs are tolerating or thriving on a raw raw diet, your dogs or cats. And um, we've got a client in particular who's asking about their dog getting recurrent bladder infections. So if they're seeing something like a bladder infection consistently and their dog's on a raw diet, would that be a sign to change to maybe a more cooked diet? Well, I, I'll, I'll start with the, the bladder infection. That's tricky to know. And I think the only way to, to really find out is to do it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I could say medically, I can't think of a reason why Mm -hmm. that would be the case. Um, but every time I say that (laughs) someone will say, well, I just tried the cook diet and all the bladder infections went away. (laughs) So I feel humble that way. Mm -hmm. Um, because the fact that she wonders, you know, I, I wonder what she knows, um, maybe, maybe on an intuitive level or the fact that she has that thought, it makes me think that there's no harm in pursuing yep, it. I totally, and, yeah, you know, that was my she, gut feeling too. Yeah. Yeah. You know, try it out and see, I think most dogs, I think 90% would be my made up statistic now <laughs> for in my practice, <laughs> 90% of dogs that I put on raw diets do really well. And the ones that don't, I think are just, it's just like us. We have just a variability from body to body um, and digestive tract to digestive tract about what works. I think sometimes it's the cold temperature um, mm. when we can, you know, if we get the frozen patties and mm. some dogs will just pretty much eat the patty frozen and be fine. But other dogs are very temperature specific and that big bolus of like freezing food just causes them to vomit right away. Mm-hmm. And then other dogs just continue um, to vomit or have diarrhea or just not be interested and when dogs aren't interested in their food, it always makes me think, oh, I wonder how that made them feel last time they ate it. Mm-hmm. And then when they approach the bowl this time, they think, oh, I don't know if I want to feel that way again. Oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so I think that um, listening to them and then also um, seeing how they do. And most dogs get amazing poops that hardly smell and they poop less maybe once a day or once every other day. And, um, sometimes that's really disturbing for people when they switch their dog, I'll get phone calls or pictures of poop that just look (laughs) so different compared to, to what they were getting on kibble. Um, but I think dogs do well because their, their gut flora changes, um, to more beneficial bacteria. But for the dogs that don't do well, um, I think just either doing, um, a freeze dried raw, sometimes that's just a little more processed and easier for them or a home cooked or, a combination between real food and kibble mm. can be just as just as good. So would you say that the kind of heart hierarchy of what you would want to do, which would be optimal for your pet, is to try the, the raw diet and to see if they thrive there? And then if not, kind of step back from there. Would that be sort of the like the the best way or the best diet you could possibly provide? Yes. Mm-hmm. I think that is ideal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Awesome. To do raw first. And then the only thing I would have to say about that is don't try to go to your local grocery store and get raw meat and make it yourself. Ah. That's usually when people get into trouble with a raw diet. One, it's really, it's like hard to balance. And two, the the meat in the meat counter, it's not meant to be consumed raw mm. for anybody. Mm-hmm. And so that gets tricky. Yeah. Yeah, you can, you can definitely see that that going a little bit sideways for folks, because I'm, I'm I'm assuming that you know muscle meat in general, like I, I you know if you just 
look in the wild, you'd see coyotes, you see wolves, you see a dog that happens across something dead and is, you know, you know an opportunist <laughs> very seldom is the first thing they go after a shoulder, you know, and they're all about the guts and they're getting in there and, and getting after that stuff. And I think that, I mean, I know for humans anyway, this is something that we're striving to bring back into our diet mm. is more organ meats and more of the, the entrails and the things that really pack a nutritional punch. And I think dogs, you know, they're, they're not subject to the same like you factor that we are, you know? So they're like into their intuition about, you know, getting the most nutritious or the most sort of nutrient dense pieces is pretty spot on. So when folks are, yes, when, when you're going to prepare yes. this raw diet for themselves, and I mean, maybe this is covered in the balance it piece, but is there some percentage or, I mean, you just want to make sure you're getting some liver in there. You know, if you got a cow tongue, throw it in there. Like what, <laughs> how has that come together for folks? Yes. And that's what makes it, makes it so challenging. Um, the clients that I do have that, uh, make their own raw diet usually have a relationship with a butcher, mm. uh, or, you know, some kind of processing plant where they feel like they know what they're getting. Um, but if, especially if you're not going to use a vitamin and mineral mix, if you don't use organ meats, a lot of the uh, minerals mm -hmm. like copper and selenium, you just can't get, um, in other places. And then if you just do, um, you know, meat and you don't do any bones, then you're really short on calcium. Mm. And it's really hard to make that up almost any other way. Mm, that makes sense. So um, curious about medications in general, um, especially like deworming medications and things like that. Is there a process that's a little bit more natural for that instead of giving, the, you know, um, pets a big bolus of chemicals? Is there a way that you can naturally deworm your pets? You know, that's a really good question. And I have to be honest that I don't I don't have a lot of experience using natural dewormers because my patients here hardly have intestinal parasites uh -huh. since nothing lives um, up here in the high <laughs> desert. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Um, I, I hear that there are, and I wish I could um, say, like speak to um, a protocol. Mm -hmm. But what I do know is that healthier animals fight off um, intestinal parasites mm -hmm. um, more efficiently than unhealthy animals mm -hmm. and that anything we can do to um, keep our dogs and our cats gut flora balanced, then they're going to have an easier time fighting that off. Mm -hmm. And then the other piece um, that's, we're, that, that's starting to emerge in veterinary medicine is we're wondering, hey, I wonder if a little bit of roundworm is good for the immune system mm -hmm. and, or, you know, should we be deworming? And certainly there are certain worms that like you should not let your dog have like mm. hookworms or things that suck their blood. We don't want any right. of those guys. <laughs> right. But we're, we're keeping our animals gut so sterile now, right. With all the antibiotics and we're deworming them. And it, it might be that that's not really the way to go. And where we, uh, you know, level out with that or decide what to do, or like what parasites get to stay and what, what get to go that, that will be really interesting. Mm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, cause it really does. I mean, the whole, the whole body situation is a community, right? And so <laughs> we're sort of carte blanche eradicating things that might be, you know, fundamentally beneficial, just like gut bacteria, you know, why not a few little parasites here and there? A <laughs> couple know? little parasites. Exactly. Are okay. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. So, um, <laughs> let's talk about older dogs and, um, particularly, uh, dogs or cats that are starting to show signs of arthritis. I know you talk about acupuncture on your website. Maybe you can talk about just what are some of the techniques for providing relief for older dogs as they start to get arthritis? I think the first thing that we can do that's helping them 24 hours a day, seven days a week is make sure we're keeping them very lean. Mm -hmm. And my senior patients, I like to keep so lean that when other people see the dogs, they make a comment. And I always tell people, that's when you know you have your dog at the right body condition. Because oh, we're so used to seeing overweight dogs and cats that when we see one that's just maybe like a little more svelte, we're appalled. Mm -hmm. um, and so the best thing we can do is first keep them very thin. And that will help them last longer. Because unfortunately for bigger dogs, um, when they can't get up anymore, that's the end of the game for them. Right. And so the longer I can keep them moving, 
um, the better. And so uh, weight loss and keeping them really lean. Now we have to be careful because we want them to maintain muscle mass Mm -hmm. so that they can keep moving, but we want them to be as thin as possible. Um, I love body work, acupuncture, um, chiropractic, massage. I think those are amazing modalities to keep dogs um, moving longer. And Mm -hmm. then there are a ton of supplements. CBD is kind of the up and coming uh, treatment for arthritis. Um, Even fish oil can be helpful and turmeric and all those things. But I'd say right now in the natural world, uh, CBD is the front runner as Mm -hmm. an anti-inflammatory. And if your dog is, I want to get to the CBD for sure, but um, really quickly, if your dog or cat is overweight, how do you, what's the best course of action? I mean, can you fast them or is this something where you should just, you know, gradually cut back their meals? What's the best course to really get them back to that ideal weight? Right. I think it depends on what you're feeding them, but I usually start by just decreasing like 10 to 15% Mm -hmm. and then moving more. We have to be Mm -hmm. careful about too much calorie restriction because we don't want their, and we don't want like nutrient depletion. Mm -hmm. Um, But if it's possible to do a little bit of both, that's what I do. Move more, eat a little bit less. Yeah. Uh, like humans. Yeah. <laughs> Just yes. like humans. Funny yeah. thing. Yeah. So the, um, so speaking of the moving thing and it, it just kind of came to me earlier when you were talking about how we're seeing cats and dogs developing more and more of these problems that uh, they're just sort of short, starting to show up. Like cats seem to have kidney disease and dogs seem to get cancer. And I'm wondering if this like the prevalence in that is because their lifestyles are fundamentally changing to model ours more you know so the more sedentary we are the more sedentary our animals are the more processed foods that we're eating probably the more processed foods our dogs are eating you know and if this just sort of increase in i don't know civilization for lack of a better term might be driving some of this you know and like just our own lifestyle factors could be affecting the way that our pets are you know, functioning. I think that's true. I mean, I think their inflammatory disease um, models ours. I mean, we're the same. We're both mammals. And just like you said, we're eating processed diets. They're really eating processed diets. Right. Um, most dogs almost never get fresh food. And so, um, and then, you know, we have more drugs and we're changing our gut flora and, you know, we're exposed to all these chemicals. And I do think um, that they are experiencing the same amount of inflammation that we are. Yeah. So one other thing on the movement piece that I, I've just wondered about, I mean, we're seeing so much of the um, emotional support animal stuff coming around, right? Where it's like now everybody's flying with whatever animal that they have. And I wonder, and this might just call for wild speculation, but how is that for dogs? You know, I mean, because if we think about jet lag for a human and we can understand what's going on, this massive shift in circadian rhythm and all of these things that are taking place, I would assume that that the dogs and cats and peacocks and whatever other sort of animals you're flying with are going to have like a similar response to that. And is that, what do you, what do you think about that? You know, I've never considered jet lag in a dog. Um, but now that I do, I think that probably our dogs are more adaptable than we are because they're not so married to this sleep cycle. Uh, I mean, they definitely have the same, I mean, they sleep at night. Um, they're such efficient nappers. Though. Yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> they really are. They probably would do better on the road than we would. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> if only they could drive. <laughs> yeah. So Angie, let's talk about CBD. Obviously, this has been a huge um, insurgence in the market for humans, but also for pets. Let's talk about what you think are some of the beneficial uses of CBD. Well, I'm really excited about CBD. Um, As an herbalist, it is the most potent herb I've ever used. Um, When I say CBD, I mean hemp. Mm -hmm. And um, its application for cats and dogs is growing every day. Um, I started using it in about, I think, 2015, 2016. And I'll, I'll use it maybe for a dog with arthritis, but then that dog also has allergies and we notice, oh, the allergies, you know, this dog's itching less. Not only is the um, arthritis better, um, we're jumping up on the bed, but we're itching less and mm. cats with arthritis use it. And, you know, cats with chronic herpes disease, I'm seeing benefit there. 
um, dogs with seizures, anxiety. Um, it's, it's just amazing um, what we're finding. Cats with a, a syndrome called hyperesthesia, where they feel like something's always on them, mm. um, they're responding well. And it's a lot of these diseases where we don't have a lot of other options. Mm. And so I think it's a really exciting time um, to be or a, do- a dog or a cat with any of these diseases because um, CBD has such widespread application now. So I'm assuming just like with any sort of supplement, the sourcing and how it's manufactured and like what the actual concentrations are and all of that stuff obviously make a big impact on, you know, the, the efficacy and safety of the whole thing. Are there sources or like a, you know, a stamp that's like certified by whatever, that's kind of the gold standard for, for this kind of stuff? Not yet. Mm. Uh, we'll get there um, for sure now that the farm bill has passed. Um, mm. But I I encourage people to look at um, the manufacturing process. Um, so we want to make sure that it was extracted with CO2. And um, we want to know where the hemp was grown. Uh, mm. We don't want hemp grown overseas because we can't regulate that very well. Right. And now that um, hemp is federally legal, I, we'll have a lot more sourcing. And so that's going to be exciting and we will have some more regulation and, yeah. and that will help us. And we want to make sure that they're, um, the company has a guaranteed analysis and that they're labeling their products. And then lastly, we want to make sure that it's actually concentrated enough. Mm. Unfortunately, I see so many pet parents buy these really weak, um, kind of just diluted out CBD formulations. And they'll say, oh, I gave my dog a drop and it didn't work. And most of the time it's because there's hardly any CBD or they won't label. I've had other companies tell me, well, the amount of CBD per milliliter is proprietary. Right. So I can't tell you. And then I'm just level, well, then I'm not going to use your product. Yeah. I have no idea. You know, yeah. I need yeah. to know. Because right. we actually do have some data around dosing. It's not very much data, um, but we have it. And um, it right now we can do pretty high doses very safely. Mm. And what what is that? Is that like a, you know, I don't even know how you measure it, nanograms per kilogram or something? What's the... What's the yes, it's... Yep. Yep. We measure it in milligrams per kilogram. Mm. And um, so the recent studies at Colorado State University did um, two milligrams per kilogram. And that's about 10 times the dose that I start. And I start with such a low dose because um, hemp is so expensive. Good hemp. Um, mm. High quality hemp is expensive. And so what we're trying to figure out is what's the lowest dose that we're going to get our effect um, so that we can spend the least amount of money. If you have a hundred pound dog on CBD, I mean, it's not out of this world to think about paying like 200 to $300 a month um, wow. for a, a reasonable dose. Uh, for an effective dose. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Crazy to think about that. Well, hopefully yes. it's the, those Canadians, they've really been jamming us up on the hemp. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah, <laughs> So um, I'd love to talk about um, anxiety in animals um, because obviously it seems like, you know, some have a higher proclivity towards more anxious behavior based on breed and maybe just, you know, their uh, environment. But is there sort of a standard of care for reducing anxiety in animals or what do you do? What do you recommend to folks that are, you know, experiencing trouble with their animals having anxiety? Well, for anyone that has noticed their dog or cat has anxiety, I just want to applaud them because that's the first step. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that's the most missed step. Um, There's so much miscommunication between people and dogs, people and cats that uh, people often, you know, repeat behaviors that are causing their dogs so much anxiety. Mm -hmm. Um, So if you've noticed that your, your pet has anxiety, that is great. And the first thing you want to do is um, look at your own behavior and think, Um, how many times a day am I actually causing my dog or cat to have anxiety? Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes just picking up our pets or, you know, we want to kiss them on the face or we want to hug them or we think it's cute when our toddler rides the dog or sits on the cat. Mm -hmm. And so I think we have the most control over that to think about what stresses them out. Um, And then giving them an environment in which they have a safe place, especially cats. We don't give them enough vertical places to go up. Um, Mm -hmm. in rooms and we don't give them enough escape routes 
Um, and then, you know, with dogs thinking about exercising them daily, just like us, um, they do so much better when they're moving. Mm -hmm. And personally, I'm like, kind of like the border collie personality where like, I probably should just take a run every day. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and if I don't get my run in, like I need to do something else, mm -hmm. um, that's mentally stimulating. And so kind of knowing that exercise is a really important piece of mental health. Mm -hmm. um, for our pets too. And then knowing that if those things don't work, we do have things like L-theanine or CBD or valerian. We have a lot of natural remedies um, in conjunction. And then when those don't work, there is nothing wrong with using Prozac or um, any pharmaceuticals to help your dog um, have a better quality of life. Because mm. um, just like us, they can get really wound up and it's really uncomfortable and um, it's hard to it's hard to feel like that all the time. Yeah, absolutely. We've really noticed with our older dog, Penelope, who's 15, she started to be much more anxious in the nighttime, in the middle of the night. She used to sleep through the night and, you know, maybe get up once or, or whatever, but it seems like she's constantly just sort of fidgety and are uncomfortable and moving from place to place. And so I'm just curious, um, you know, for older dogs, do they just, is it almost like older people where they just, you know, have a harder time sleeping through the night or, or any suggestions around that as they start to get older? Yes. So the, the nighttime anxiety with older dogs is really common and, um, it might be kind of the start of cognitive dysfunction. Mm -hmm. And so for those dogs, I, I used to, um, I use mostly Chinese medicine. Mm -hmm. so I think that's one of the best tools I have. So herbs and acupuncture, um, but then also antioxidants like SAMI and um, using higher doses of fish oil. Sometimes that can help. And then when that doesn't help, I, I will use things to help anxiety at night, like L-theanine mm -hmm. or CBD um, or just something to help them mellow out. Yeah. Got it. Um, speaking of Penelope getting older, <laughs> I've got one other question for you. Um, so she is starting to experience some uh, visual, some some vision loss, but it seems like it's uh, specific to light coming into her eyes. It's almost like she gets confused by the light coming in and she almost thinks something's in front of her. Is there something that we can give her to help with that degeneration or to help improve that? Or is that just kind of baked into the cake as she starts to get older? You know, not necessarily. I think what would be interesting to know is uh, where the disease is in her eye. If does she have a cataract? Um, is, you know, is there a problem with her retina? Mm -hmm. And I would say either having your veterinarian look or a veterinary ophthalmologist uh -huh. um, look so that you could better understand where it is mm -hmm. okay. and how to help her. Yeah, great. The last time we were in, it's funny, it's really come on quite quickly, but the last time he did say it was not a cataract that it's almost like she just had a, a filmy eye, so to speak, but the the changes in her vision have been pretty acute lately. So that's great advice. Thank you. Um, You're welcome. Let's see here. What else do we want to talk about? Well, I mean, I can talk about animals all day long. <laughs> it's like, yeah, they're just, too. Yeah, they're, they're, they're just my favorite. Um, so something that you mentioned earlier about cats specifically needing these high places and just it's like this, they, they must just have some sort of fundamental angst about being eaten or about not being able to get away from whatever, even if it's just somebody who actually just wants to pet them because cats seem to be that way. I'm wondering, and it totally makes sense to me. It's like, all right, they, cause you see it all the time, right? You go into a house and you're like, I don't know why, but my cat's always on top of the bookshelf. You know, it's like the one <laughs> spot they just go and, and chill and hang out. And I mean, obviously some cats live in an environment where it's just not really super safe for them to be outside. But I just wonder about, you know, the ones that are just clammed up in an apartment all the time, if that becomes a much more important aspect of their life, you know, just making sure that they're getting to express their catness, so to speak, somehow in the way that they're, you know, navigating the, the, the box that they live in versus one that maybe gets to go cruise around outside and it's, it's fine in the neighborhood. Absolutely. I think cats um, that are trapped in apartments um, or don't have a very enriched um, home, and I have been guilty of that in my life because I actually just didn't know better. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, if that 
if that is someone's cat, it's not that um, you've done anything wrong. I just think as a society, we are not really good at taking care of cats. Mm. We treat them like small dogs and they're a really underserved um, companion animal. And we're figuring out that we don't feed them often enough that in the wild, they would eat 10 to 20 times a day and we feed them twice a day. Wow. And it really stresses them out and it changes their physiology. And then when they don't have the environmental enrichment of, you know, taking down a cricket mm-hmm. or, you know, or a bird or a bunny, I think that can be really stressful. And then um, that does affect um, their physical health as well. We know that stress can bring on um, bladder disease in cats and um, there's so much that we don't understand about how much we're stressing them out and how much inflammation we're causing. And so I think anything uh, pet parents can do to help enrich their kitty's environment, whether it's feeding them more or using food puzzles or giving them mm. shelves or places to kind of go up and just start respecting um, your cat's space and understanding that they may seem aloof, but they actually still want interaction. Mm. It's just in their own way. And we don't really know how to read cat's body language as a society. Um, we just assume that, you know, they're, um, they don't want to hang out with us and that they're not that interested. And I don't <laughs> think that's quite true. Yeah. They're- <laughs> Yeah, they're they're uh, they seem to be very one directional in that kind of stuff. Like they're not good at communicating. Well, or like you said, we're not good at understanding what it is that they want. Correct. <laughs> yes, and we have a long way to go. But I think we just have to keep, like take the first step and and do what we can. <laughs> yeah. So uh, this has been so informative, Angie. I really love it. And thank you so much for being with us. Um, If there's someone out there that's, you know, this is brand new to the idea of even having, you know, a more holistic approach with their animals, what's a couple of things that you would suggest to them that it's kind of low hanging fruit, things that they could do to make a difference for their pet that would make a really substantial improvement to their health that maybe would be just a simple shift to make? I think if you have a dog, just reconsider food. Um, Maybe start sharing a little bit of your food. I know most uh, veterinarians say no people food, but I think that's not really trusting people. Where we mean like no pizza or chicken McNuggets. (laughs) Um, But I think you know if you're baking an egg, share that egg with your dog. Um, We just want to stay away from um, grapes, raisins, um, onions, and macadamia nuts. And so I think adding some fresh whole foods um, onto your dog's diet is a good step. And for cats, getting your cat off kibble can be life-changing. Getting them onto a canned or a raw diet um, can absolutely uh, change their entire picture of health. Mm. And for cats and dogs, what's a sort of general amount of raw food per pound for body weight? Oh, you know, we don't, it, it depends on the composition of mm-hmm. the food okay. and then it depends on the composition of the pet and their right. lifestyle. <laughs> <laughs> so it's tricky. Yeah. I Got wish it. I had. Yeah. So, so maybe just um, look at the raw food that you're purchasing. Do they typically have recommendations per body weight? They do. And usually they're having you feed way too much. Uh-huh. Although I think it's pretty hard to be overweight on a raw diet. Mm. I've yet to see it. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Just like with us, it's really hard to be overweight when you're eating, you know, meats and vegetables. Right. It's yeah. just almost impossible. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. And with your cat, if you can get a remote control car, put the food in the back of it, let it chase it. <laughs> Absolutely. I'll probably relieve some stress too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. So Andy, tell folks how they can get in touch with you. You have an awesome website with a ton of articles that are really useful, chock full of great information. Where can they find you? Thank you. Um, You can find me at boulderholisticvet.com. And you do remote um, consults, right? So if folks aren't in the area, they, they have an issue, they can still reach out to you and schedule a consult. It depends on where they are and Mm -hmm. what the telemedicine rules are, where they are. Got it. Okay. So maybe send in an email to to find out about the areas. Yes. Yeah. If you have a question, send me an email. My email address is Angie, A-N-G-I-E, at boulderholisticvet.com. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. This is super informative. I know our audience got a lot out of it. And maybe we'll do a round two in a couple of months. I think this is awesome just to give some folks some stuff to chew on for a bit. I would love that. 
Yeah, cool. All right, folks, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you soon. Bye. And that's a wrap, folks. I hope you guys got something out of this podcast. It was, um, to me, like super informative, and as I kind of pointed out a few times, it's like, man, animals and humans are pretty similar. They're you know, really like similar, it a turns lot out. Of the, a lot of the recommendations and all of this stuff, you know, she just... Yeah, most of you, our listeners, are, are taking a pretty serious look at your own health and, and kind of trying to apply some ancestral principles to it. And it turns out, you know, it's very much the same for your animals. Absolutely. So, yeah. That's and for cool. folks out there who enjoyed this episode and you think it might help somebody you know or love or care about, make sure you share it. Um, yeah. Sharing is caring. And one of the best things you can do for the podcast is just share it. So if you got something informative out of this and you think a loved one or someone in your circle would benefit as well, then by all means, share away. We share would away. love that. Yeah, there's even a button. There is even a button. You just share it. And if you're really feeling super enthusiastic, you can subscribe and leave a five-star review. And share it. And share it. I mean, there are so many <laughs> options <laughs> for you yeah. here at Be The Wellness and how you can share the podcast and send love to the podcast. Yeah. So thank you so much for being with us. We will see you next week. Bye. Bye. And I don't think